Hello, I'm Professor McCoy, and today I want to talk to you about science and magic. This came up recently in uh, a discussion we were having about uh, C.S. Lewis's The Abolition of Man, one of my classroom lectures, which if you haven't seen it yet, you can find the link to it in the description as well as in, uh, in the cards above, etc. In the final chapter of this book, uh, C.S. Lewis uh, discusses the idea of man's power over nature and how this is a driving force in our society and it is one that can uh, unfortunately invert upon itself can turn in on itself and can ultimately destroy those men who engage in it uh, this is a complicated discussion and if you want more of uh, more detail on that in particular uh, that more general topic uh, go to that lecture and uh, see how see how we wound up discussing it in the classroom However, I want to focus uh, this time on a particular example that he gives of the kind of thing that he's talking about, this, this man's conquest over nature and the sort of thing uh, that man does in order to try to conquer nature. And this is an analogy that Lewis draws between uh, the modern natural sciences and magic, uh, applied magic, if you will. Uh, to set the frame for this, I want to read a uh, I want to read a short passage from uh, from the book. Uh, so, quote: You will find people who write about the 16th century as if magic were a medieval survival, and science the new thing that came in to sweep it away. Those who have studied the period know better. There is very little magic in the Middle Ages. The 16th and 17th centuries are the high noon of magic. The serious magical endeavor and the serious scientific endeavor are twins. One was sickly and died, the other strong and throve, but they were twins. They were born of the same impulse. I allow that some, certainly not all, of the early scientists were actuated by a pure love of knowledge, but if we consider the temper of that age as a whole, we can discern the impulse of which I speak. There is something which unites magic and applied science while separating both from the wisdom of earlier ages. For the wise men of old, the cardinal problem had been how to conform the soul to reality, and the solution had been knowledge, self-discipline, and virtue. For magic and applied science alike, the problem is how to subdue reality to the wishes of men. The solution is a technique, and both in the practice of this technique are ready to do things hitherto regarded as disgusting and impious, such as digging up and mutilating the dead. We see here this comparison that I find utterly fascinating, particularly in the modern or sort of post-Enlightenment or at least post-Renaissance context. As Lewis said, we tend to think of the Middle Ages as the time of magic, where people were trying to do uh, magical things, things which uh, harnessing the supernatural in ultimately unsuccessful ways. We think of things like alchemy, we think of as sort of the precursor to modern, modern chemistry. We think of things like uh, perhaps astrology being the precursor to uh, to modern astronomy. And then we think of things uh, in fantasy literature, for example. If in any uh, what we call medieval fantasy setting, we find magic. Magic of all sorts. Typically, magic which is designed to harness the powers of the natural or perhaps supernatural world for our own benefit as man or whatever other fantasy species we might be talking about. However, as Lewis points out, this is fundamentally a misunderstanding of real human history. In reality, the Middle Ages was was far more mundane uh, in terms of the magical endeavor than we think of. Uh, in fact, there was there, there was significantly less superstition in the Middle Ages than you might even find today. Of course, different superstitions. There were some. Um, there were uh, there were of course attempts at. Uh, attempts at naturalistic remedies uh, for diseases, uh, which would strike us as perhaps magical things, uh, things having to do with relics, things having to do with uh, with unknown properties of physical materials, things like that. There were uh, practices which we also might think of as perhaps magic, but were understood roughly naturalistically. Things like uh, chance prayers or incantations to uh, uh, over a particular crafting process or a creative process, whether that's cooking or, or tempering steel or what have you. But of course, they understood this to be a measurement of time because, again, prayers were uh, had a certain cadence to them and they were a particularly uh, precise measurement of time, especially if you 
if you know the precise cadence from mass every week or more. And so what we find in the Middle Ages are things that we today might think of as attempts at magic, but were really simply attempts at interacting with the world they found themselves in. What Lewis points out to us is that the 16th and 17th centuries, that is, uh, post-Renaissance, the Enlightenment period, saw the rise of both magic and science. Now, science as we know it today uh, is fundamentally uh, finds itself about uh, applying the knowledge that we find to harnessing the powers of the natural world. That is, we see a fundamental connection between what we would call uh, the theoretical sciences and the applied sciences, and we think of the theoretical sciences as being for the purpose of the applied sciences. We think of, say, uh, physics and engineering. That physics is the abstract study, and then engineering is applying the principles of, say, physics to something like building a bridge or, uh, or manufacturing a computer chip. But we see engineering as the, the end goal <clears throat> of, uh, of really any of the sciences. And this is because we see science just as the early moderns did, as our, prede as our predecessors in, uh, in the Renaissance and the Enlightenment, and the, well, as he says, the 16th and 17th centuries, we see science as a way of controlling nature, of, of dominating the natural world and bending it to our whims, using what natural resources we can find and we can harness for good purposes. Now, this has a benefit to it. This obviously has a great benefit to it. You're capable of hearing and seeing what I have to say that is only accomplished through this kind of conquest over nature uh, that Lewis both lauds and decries. Because at the same time, as I discussed in that lecture, there are significant downsides to this conquest and significant dangers even beyond those simple, obvious downsides. But that's neither here nor there. What I'd rather speak about, again, is the similarity to magic, because magic is fundamentally about harnessing the power of the world around us, whether we consider it natural or supernatural. That distinction gives us, uh, brings us to somewhat of another digression. The medieval understanding of the supernatural was very, very different from what we might think of today. When we think of something being supernatural, we mean that it is beyond simply the physical. You might find a, uh, a philosopher, whether professional or amateur, thinking of the soul, the human soul, being immaterial as supernatural. To the medieval mind, this could not be further from the truth. The soul, whether it is physical or beyond physical or whatever it might be, is the most natural thing one can think of because it is what is definitive of human nature. It is natural to a human being to be ensouled. If there are what we would probably call supernatural forces, magical forces that could in theory be harnessed by a magician or a wizard or a sorcerer or what have you, or a witch or what have you, the medievals would have considered that strictly natural because it is, the, it is following the natural course of events in the world. What the medievals referred to as supernatural was only, effectively, miracles. What God does to abrogate the ordinary natural course of things, and the natural course of things could include what, whether things that are physical, things that are non-physical, things that go beyond physical, the, uh, the ordinary actions, say, of angels would be considered perfectly natural. Angels were natural beings, as understood by all the angelologists of the Middle Ages, of the scholastic period of Christendom. We, of course, think of this radically differently, but that is because we are, broadly speaking, physicalists. We are materialists. Uh, and this is due to, due to I would think, uh, largely in part, uh, largely to the, the success of the scientific endeavor of the early modern period and the failure of the magical endeavor. Because these two impetuses... Impetuses? These two impulses? <laughs> These two impulses, uh, we find, had the same goal in mind, that is, restraining, containing, and then channeling the physical world, on the one hand, in terms of the sciences, and the metaphysical or the non-physical world, in the, case of the, um, in the case of magic, for human purposes. One succeeded, obviously, and one failed, just as obviously. We are not capable of 
of uh, channeling the non-physical forces of reality uh, anything uh, in any way beyond perhaps psychology uh, if anything but just because one failed and one succeeded uh, this seems to have given us a sort of dichotomy between thinking of things which are describable in scientific terms as natural and things which are not describable in strictly scientific terms as supernatural uh, or, or unnatural even. Again, I think that if we take this, this medieval mindset of thinking of things going according to their ordinary course, whether that is physical or not, as natural, then I think we can more easily see the parallelism between magic and science. Now, to the point of this uh, of the parallelism, I spoke earlier of fantasy literature, which I think is uh, is a good case study for this uh, this sort of parallelism, this this uh, the the twinned nature of magic and science. Because if you look to how magic works in most fantasy literature, not all, but most fantasy literature, at least fantasy literature which isn't rooted deeply in a medieval culture, uh, or at least a uh, medieval worldview, in other words, the fantasy literature not written by C.S. Lewis and his dear friend uh, J.R.R. Tolkien. Most modern fantasy literature you find, magic is treated as if it were scientific. It is simply a way that some people manage to harness and control the forces of the world around them in certain ways towards their own personal human ends. A couple of key examples uh, are perhaps the two archetypal magical type of fantasy fantastical stories uh, one being the, the medieval fantasy uh the medieval fantasy du jour which is dungeons and dragons probably the most popular medieval fantasy uh, genre or franchise or cult what you want uh, at least right now and if you look at how magic works in dungeons and dragons it is a series of uh it is a series of processes and specific spells that accomplish certain ends they might as well be either chemical formulae, they may as well be instruction manuals from Ikea, for that matter. A spell in Dungeons & Dragons is built to accomplish a particular end, a particular goal, and it accomplishes it, it, accomplishes it by harnessing the magic of the world, which, within that context, is strictly naturalistic. The weave, as it's called in Dungeons & Dragons, is simply a part of the world, just as much as as, you know, electrons and protons and neutrons are part of the world as we understand it scientifically. The other example I can point to is Harry Potter, another, again, prototypical fantasy story which involves magic, and this time a, a sort of modern or urban fantasy. However, it still has the, uh, the uh, precisely the same understanding of magic that, we're, uh, that uh, Lewis is talking about and that we were looking at with Dungeons and Dragons. The spells and the uh, and the potions and the enchantments and everything in Harry Potter are again discovered. It's explicit throughout the series that spells are something which we discover how to use, or witches and wizards discover how to use, and manipulate the world around them. They use tools to do so, whether that is a wand or whether that is, whether that is the ingredients in a potion or anything else like that. And through the use of these artifacts, these tools, they manipulate the world and bend the world around them to their wishes, just like we might with technology. I am, to at least some degree, bending the uh, the the photons emitting from your uh, from your screen, whatever you happen to be watching this on, such that they are conveying the image of my head and shoulders. And my speaking voice is uh, is being uh being impressed upon you through the speakers of your device etc all of this is done through magic or technology or is there really a difference i would argue that uh that uh, and i'm not i'm not taking this in a sort of arthur c clark uh, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic sort of way because i think that any technology is in indistinguishable from magic at least both taking both in the modern context because technological developments are simply a way of trying to harness the powers of the world around us for our own uh, for our own ends or our own desires 
And magic is simply the same attempt to do the exact same thing using slightly different means. Means that we know in the real world are ineffective, but we can look to hypothetical worlds, subcreated worlds, which, which have different rules of nature. And in some cases, when those laws of nature allow for such things, humans, at least some humans, under some circumstances, are capable of harnessing these uh, these preternatural or supernatural or non-physical attributes of the world in the very same way that ordinary people today, or at least scientifically inclined people today, harness the natural world around them. So this is a uh, this was a relatively short talk, but this was a uh, was an, uh, a topic that I particularly find fascinating, primarily uh, for a couple of reasons because I find fantasy literature involving magic to be fascinating. Uh, I also find that the the modern uh, the modern use of magic um, is very important. I think in in considering, uh, especially from a Christian perspective, right? Again, I am as you may probably know, I am Catholic myself, um, and a rather traditional Catholic at that. We often find Christians who balk at stories involving magic because there are various very clear biblical prohibitions against magic, including some of the specific types of magic that are uh, that that uh, that are used in these contexts: necromancy, evocation, um, conjuration, and such. All of which, again, are explicitly prohibited. However, it is important to note that in most modern contexts, in the context of most uh, most modern stories uh, involving magic. What we're really talking about is a kind of technology. It's a kind of applied science in a world with different physical rules. Physical, natural, what we want. And so, if you are, uh, if you are perfectly fine with say, a science fiction story in which the physical laws of reality are different from our own, such that say faster than light travel is possible, then I see no reason why you would object to a world in which the natural rules of reality are different, such that certain people are capable of casting what we call spells, using, t well, what are functionally pieces of technology, wands and potion pots and such. This is one element that I find fascinating. I also find fascinating the, uh, the difference in perspective that I outlined briefly between the medieval and the modern view on these sorts of matters. And this is something that I think that uh, C.S. Lewis was particularly sensitive to, and I think this is one of the things that we can look uh, to Lewis to find uh, more than a lot of authors, because he was a modern man, certainly, lived in the 20th century, but he read as much as he, I think, uh, as much as anyone in the 20th century, probably, from and about the Middle Ages. And so there's a great deal to learn about uh, our past, which can, I think, shine light on how we understand our present. I think that is a good note to end on. So thank you for listening. I hope we learned something. I hope we enjoyed. And I'll see you next time.